And then finally, as we're sharing, if somebody could please type names into the uh, into the chat, and that makes it uh, easier for everyone to follow along. So if you have mushrooms that you would like to share, basically we just get in order, first come, first serve. So some people have typed into the chat already that they have some to share. Um, so if anybody else has any that they would like to share from their own computer, please put your name in the chat and I'll call on you. We'll go through some of those first and then I'll go into my emails and uh, start there as well. So um, Alianka, you, you're the first person to volunteer. Would you like to uh, start us off tonight? Yes, hi, sure. Um, I just found these mushrooms in my yard. Um, can I share the picture with you guys? Yeah, please, go right ahead. Uh, let's see how this works. Uh, so I just share my screen, right? Mm -hmm. um, okay. Anything work? Is it working? We are seeing. Yep, we're starting to see something. I can see some mushrooms in there. <laughs> can you see mushrooms or no? Yes, we can. So I was thinking this might be. Let me type the name. Um, I think it's this name. I don't know how to pronounce it. Uh, Curibomyces mutabilis. <laughs> mm. I don't know if that's, that's correct. That's a heck of a name. <laughs> Do you have and any more pictures? Okay, can you, you see don't. this one? Mm -hmm. And then it's that. They work, they grow in clusters. Uh, there are some ferns around it, some moss. Um, it's under the birches. Some other tree I'm not sure about. Um, <laughs> uh, Japanese maple, I'm being helped. And um, yeah, a few little pine trees around. And there are a lot of them. I thought it was this mushroom, <laughs> but I'm not sure. I, they have little skirts and they smell really good. They smell sweet. I, I have the same thing um, in my pictures. And so I think it's one of the armillaria species. And oh. although, although they uh, mostly are uh, clustered around um, stumps and trees um, because they're parasitic, this particular species, which I think is Armillaria gallica, is mm -hmm. actually a saprophyte, saprobe, um, and it's on lives on organic matter in the soil, according to um, uh, mushroomexpert.com. Let me see. I had um, so I if, had... if you take a spore print, it's not going to be. Um, white it's going to i mean it's not going to be the cortinarius color the uh, rusty brown but it's going to be white mm. okay all right yeah. well i don't i don't have any other mushrooms to share <laughs> yeah I, I think it's i think it's an armillaria too and igor agrees as well so you're getting a little consensus here that it's one of the armillarias thank you guys so much i really appreciate it exciting <laughs> sharing how do i stop this okay there you go hold on oh wait okay so i think the next person would be were you were you volunteering to share your blue it's bianca <laughs> okay so i just went outside in my front lawn and just picked it just a moment ago so I, I don't know if, can I make myself full screen? How do I do this? Uh, full, no, view full screen, no. View speaker. I think it's up to each one of us to, to how we choose to see you. Oh, okay. All right. So it is a gorgeous lilac color um, with the kind of looking um, same texture, but having the, the uh, kind of almost like a white, 
I don't know how to describe this uh, webby material. The margin looks like just barely looks like it could be striped, and the gills are very lilac as well. So I'll just um, also the stalk is is narrow lilac, and it goes uh, from lilac to kind of like a whitish pattern. So I'll see if if I can try to make it clear in the in the camera. So we that's see better the, when he's further. See better if it's further. Yeah, is this yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm trying to get it so it doesn't shine too much. So that's the top. <laughs> it matches your sweater, they said. <laughs> it does match my sweater. A basket, yeah. These are the gills, again, lilac color. Beautiful. And then the stalk is a lilac going to white, but I can't tell you what, what exactly the pattern name. Let me see. I wonder if I can, maybe if I shine a light on it. No. Is the is the base thicker than the rest of the stipe? I couldn't say that it is. Okay. Uh, it it looks about the same. Let me see if I can maybe shine a light on it for you. It'd be easier. Why isn't it working? Oh, that's why. All right. Oh, that doesn't work. All right. So that's. No, it's not that much better. Is that better? Can you see the stipe any better that way? So it's not really thicker on the bottom than it is on the rest of it. But it's got just gorgeous lilac gill. I've never seen this in my front yard before. My fiance just pointed out to, to me this morning, or I mean this evening, uh, just as we got home. So I'm thrilled about this. I jumped up and down. And I'm like, I think those are bluets. And <laughs> got super excited. <laughs> so are we going with bluets? I honestly, personally, I can't see it well enough to make a judgment call from, okay. from looking yeah. at it that way. You'd have to make, make a score print. That'll clinch it. Yeah. So the only other mushroom that's purple I can think of is Vicaria methystina, but the gills are widely spaced for that one. No, and these it's not that one. Yeah, it's too, the cap will be too big yeah. in relation to the stem. All right, so I'll do a spore print. Am I expecting a white spore print from this guy? Pinkish. Pinkish? Okay. Uh, and there are other lepistas too. Like maybe two more that would be confused with this one. I mean, if it is La Pista Nuda. This does seem pretty young also, and I have several more in the yard. They are grown uh, just on the grass, and it's just um, singly. They, they grow alone. I just can't remember the name, but there is another La Pista, at least one, that grows in grass and is confused with the La Pista Nuda. Okay. Uh, Lepista sordida. What's the name, Igor? Lepista sordida. Uh -huh, uh -huh. yeah. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Sordida. Uh -huh. uh, Bianca. Okay. Nuda and sordida. Got it. I'll look that. Yep. Uh, and I'm proud to have uh, eaten, I think, my, what might be a very... Um, uh, well, for me, it's an expert mushroom because I'm no expert, but I was very happy to find and eat the honey mushroom. Which Yay. one? Honey mushroom. So that's the... I had the name for you already and I closed it. I'm sorry. Armillaria. Armillaria. Hmm. That's it. But specifically, the one that I had was uh, the one with the yellow scaly cap and the very uh, white uh veil uh and i'm trying to remember the name of that one specifically malaya was it malaya malaya i think that sounds right that sounds but i'll show you the picture of that really quickly uh, let me see if i can share correctly uh you know what i'm just going to do it on here let me see if that works i tell you honey mushrooms right now are like gangbusters <laughs> everywhere yeah, you drive down through the Pine Barrens and it's like 
you can't look in any direction without seeing them. <laughs> oh, really? On what road? 532? Um, going into Brendan Burn. There's areas. Yeah, that's them. Route 70. So here's the scaling. Yep, that's the one. Yep. This is not it. Let me just go. Uh, and right next to it was growing a larger, uh, older one. Uh, I did not pick this one, but I, I did cook and eat the other one, this one. So I, I uh, rinsed it. Uh, I mean, I, I blanched it, I should say, uh, in, in hot water. And then I fried it in uh, pork tenderloin leftovers, which had salt, lemon, um, rosemary, and they were fantastic. So I highly suggest it. You want to you go back to that uh, double picture? The yeah, double? Yeah. Which one? I'm sorry. These two? You know, the one where you showed the young one and the old one? But that's a good picture, too. Oh, there you uh, go. Yeah, look at the difference in them. How, like the young ones on the left versus how big they are on the right. And yeah. Fairly different looking. Very true. When I started out, I wouldn't have guessed that they were the same mushroom, but yeah, now I know better. And then other, these. I was going to say that, up, that other picture you had too, where you're holding your hand shows how big they can be too. I've been stumped. I've been stumped by Malaya before thinking it was something else because they were so big when they, when they get older. This is actually a, uh, a hedgehog mushroom, I believe. Um, sorry, I'll, uh, let me get the right name for it. Which I did not expect to be this big. Uh, this is the, no. Hydnum repandum? Yes, Hydnum repandum. No, it's not. No, hold on. Let me go back to it. That one is European. We don't have right. repandum here. Oh, that's right. Sorry, Igor. We have 16 species of hydnum, and they require at least microscopic examination and preferably DNA analysis. Uh, so this one was quite large and in uh, the Turkey Swamp Park, and I was very surprised to see the teeth on it. Uh, and it, the, the teeth were very fragile when you, when I touched them, they broke off very easily. Um, and I tried to make an X in it to see if it has uh, any kind of staining from it. And it didn't seem to actually take, it just was very, like I said, fragile. You can see on the top here that uh, it was breaking off very easily. Um, we found a humongous uh, hydnum at the uh, Smith foray last weekend. And it uh, was about the same size as this one. Um, and so far from sequencing, what we sequence here in New Jersey, one species tends to be very commonly found. It's called Hydnum subolympicum. I'm going to type it in. I'm not saying yours is that, but it could be. Okay. But to beginners out there, um, your field guides are going to call it Hydnum repandum, but new information has it that that you know that's a european species and we've got a whole bunch of new ones done by a graduate student research I've got two or three separate papers the first paper that came out was by europeans in the scandinavian uh scandinavian name swedish or norwegian i forget and then another paper came out with baroni and sweeney that's from 2018, and there might have been a third paper out. They're all in the public domain. You don't have to pay for them. You just have to search for them. But you'll see that we, the diversity of hydnum in eastern United States is just uh, mind-boggling. Boggling. We have over 12 species, wow. uh, probably 16. So you will not be easily, uh, you'll not be able to put a name on those easily without doing some extra work. All right, well, that's, even though I have like a million mushrooms, I'm very excited about those. So I, that's all I wanted to show tonight. Okay, thanks Bianca. Thank you. Did you eat the, uh, the two fungus? No? At, at the time I didn't know it was edible. So my loss. Yep, it is. I think you know when they're when when they're really big like this. I've never I've I've hardly ever eaten them myself, 
but um, Dave Wachalowski, who we haven't, we haven't seen in a couple weeks, but he's been traveling. Those are the ones he says, I think that he scrapes those, uh, those spines off because they like, get all over the place when we're cooking them. We have that's, that's where the flavor is actually in the, in the teeth. Thank you. Oh yeah, same thing with bullets in the tubes. Well, that's that's what uh, Dave tells us. Okay, Frank, did you, you don't you, you don't have experience eating them. I've only eaten them a handful of times, mm -hmm. and I've never really. I don't think I've ever. I must never. I don't know. They don't. Really, they never really stood out for me. So, no, I, I don't really have like them. Um, I haven't. I don't have a lot of experience eating them. I haven't tried them yet myself. They're very honest, good. I got to be honest with you. I hardly eat mushrooms at all anymore. They should be good because they're the relatives of chanterelles. Yeah, I mean, I do. I eat, I, eat, I eat a little bit of mushrooms here and there, but I like them. I just don't get around to eating them. I'm too busy trying to get them all uploaded. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, Frank, you want to go? Okay, sure. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, last Friday, I received two uh, fr two frantic calls. Um, okay. Let's see, How did that share? Okay, am I? Are you seeing what's on my screen? The uh, the cut the cut up yes. thing. Yes. Um. No, you're not seeing that. All right, let me try sharing again. Yes, I I, I see the cut up. Uh, it slices oh, right. Up. Right, right, right. Okay, so, uh, so the uh, the first frantic call says, "Oh, I found truffles," and I said, "Well, send me a picture." And it turned out to be the aborted and Paloma uh, from the last week's uh, uh, ID session. Uh, so I was able to help them with that. But this one, um, I said, it's not a mushroom. It's definitely not a, a truffle. Um, but I could not identify what it could possibly be from. And the outside, is this hairy mass? Um, I have another photo. Um, is it an earth ball? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, yeah, one of the sclerodermas. Yep. Oh, it's a scleroderma with the. Uh, okay. What, yeah. what, was it above ground or buried? Um, well, they said it was a truffle, and this was just was a cold call. So from from somebody that's that was outside the club, looks pretty um, looks pretty dirty, like like a lot of yeah, dirt very on. Dirty. Look yeah, dirty. Like looks like it was buried. Looks like it was buried. So it might be that thing that um, um, Tali Pocletum grows on. Elaphomyces. Elaphomyces, right? Yes. Yeah. Now I think it's one of those sclerodermas that yeah, actually can break yeah. break through. Um, Blacktop. The um, right, the, right. The the distinction between the white part and the black part is too extreme. The it's scleroderma like, start out white and fade to black oh, from the middle yeah. on in, and it fades. It it's not such a, a stark starkly uh, denoted boundary like you see here. I think these are something underground. Aphomyces, uh, as as Marcel just said. That's what. I and I just want to see if I could um, go back and get to the other picture. Dave, what if the white part on the outside of this is the the skin portion? It's just a thicker layer of, of the skin instead of the, sp the spore producing surface. Too, too thick. Scleroderma have um, skin that is no more than just a few millimeters thick. Okay. That looks like it was definitely buried. Yeah, yeah. that's a that, that's a that's a truffle like thing. I mean, it's maybe not false, technically false truffle. truffle. Yeah, false yeah, truffle. Apple or something like that. All right. Very good. Well, thank you for solving that mystery. And I will stop share. Cool. Thanks, Frank. Okay. All right, Lauren.
Hi, sorry. All right. Wait, actually, is that the wrong one? All right, can you see my screen? Yes. Um, yep. So my naturalist was suggesting this is Serioporia spissa. Does that sound right? Got any closer pictures? Yes. I mean, it looks right. Is it poroid? The colors look right, I should say. Lauren, did it have pores? Um, I don't know. I didn't look that close. Um, Come on, Lauren. <laughs> <laughs> well, to be fair, I was working and I was walking two crazy dogs. So I did my best with oh, two right. crazy can, dogs. Can you uh, make it uh, bigger? So we can see some details somewhere. Um, yeah, I just don't know how to get this Zoom crap out of the way. So that it's on the left. On the left, the the positive. Yeah, I think Lauren. I think if you like hold down on that that toolbar, I think you can drag it out of the way. Oh yeah. Okay. I, I think. Or clicking on the photo too sometimes. Ooh, the dragging worked. That was good. Okay. This area poor. It doesn't look, hasn't have pores. It probably does. We probably just can't see it, but does Seraporia, oh. does that shelf out like that a little bit? Like, see how that, that looks like it's trying to. The only other thing I could think of is Flebia, but I not, mean, some of those were flabia. even changed. Not Flebia? No, no Flebia. All right, just a guess. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to see the pores. Hmm. Yeah. Because there is a Flavia cochineo fulba, something like that. Flavia cochine, cochineo fulba, maybe. So Marisol, what should I look for to tell between the one that I, or that- Peripolius <laughs> pizza is a resupinate polypore, so it has pores. Um, flavias don't have spores, they have a smooth or teeth. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I think also oh, texture. Check the texture. Is it rubbery or is it hard? Okay. Yeah, I'll say the seroporias tend to be like really resupiny, like like it completely is. flat. Yeah. And this one looks like it's really getting some serious like whatever, like lump yeah. lumpiness going on there. Yeah, it, it does, and almost like gravitational. You see that it's that kind of dripping bumpiness. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Huh. It could be that. Flavia cochineo fulbo something. It is really something. I mean, it was so crazy red. And it was interesting because I saw this on my friend's property and then oh I went goodness. foraging somewhere else and saw it somewhere else. So I'm thinking whatever it is seems to be somewhat common or is that not the case? No, no we don't, if it is the Flavia, it doesn't look common. We need you to some go back years, <laughs> Some years, things that are typically uncommon become suddenly Flavia. very common oh my gosh you can go to Flavia Cochineo Fulba it looks like that it yes I just I just google that and the photographs oh, match it does um okay did that? you put that in the chat Flavia what is it I'll type it in Cochineo okay thank you and and so, if motion? you want to come I'll show it show you show it to you <laughs> oh my gosh that's a rare we never found it around here what oh thing? my gosh they have this a lot in like various spots in their yard. Oh man. And it's beautiful. impossible to miss because it is like flaming red. <laughs> that's it, yeah. That's how people spot it. Yep. 
Oh my gosh, that's beautiful. Yeah, it's really pretty. All right, I'll go on to the next. Wait, wait, wait. Oh. What's the um? What's that little gray and white blob there at one o'clock? If you zoom in, and the dark background below below the moss. Like here? Yeah, yeah. Is that something? See? Yep. You mean on the upper side? Right here? Yes. Oh. And above it. Uh. Above it in the uh, right uh, upper corner, there's something which looks different. See, maybe not. It, it looks like, I saw that too. It looks like Botrio Basidio simili, but no, without looking too close, mm -hmm. can't tell. Okay. The one on the upper right. Can you zoom in some more, please? Yes, right there with the drops. Yeah, with the drops. Mm -hmm. All the way to the uh -huh, uh -huh. Yep. Oh, yeah, there's something else. Yeah. Yep. There's something else. Look like something else. Oh, my goodness. That's so beautiful. <laughs> Let me what know if you want to come visit. It's in my dreams because like, we don't find it around here. <laughs> All right. Nice. Good, I'm glad I showed it because I was like, ah, oh, Marisol's going to be bored with this. She's probably <laughs> seen it a million times. In the no, no, only in weeks. books, never in, in mushroom. That's funny. All right. Um... What county are you in, Lauren, that you found this? Hundred in. This was in Morris County. Um, this one was all by itself. It was really neat. Um, I couldn't figure out what it was on my own. I did a spore print. I don't remember what it was. <laughs> Is it a Gleophorus of some sort? It was a real slimy cap. It looked kind of slimy. It, yeah, it was real slimy. The whole thing was slimy. Yeah, it looks like Grophorus family. Yeah, it looks like it's terrestrial also. So that would weigh against Mycena and in favor of Gleophorus. Yeah, that was in the ground for sure. Okay. You know uh, what? There's this there's this amber colored gliop gliophorus, gliophorus. Um uh, that that's been the, the name has been shared on Mushroom Observer a few times, um, and I forget what it is, um, but it's not one that's typically found in the field guides. Um, if you search Mushroom Observer of Gliophorus, um, you might run across it there. I think, I think I remember something like this. Oh, oh, there's this Gliophorus. Um, Oh, it's got some weird name, like um, yes. complicated, not complicated, but something that suggests like it's hard to tell what it is actually. Um, but anyway, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Okay. Where did I find these? Um... Oh, this was the same yard as that Flebia. Um, these were in the ground. These were next to each other. Um, brown spore print. Brown spore print? Yeah. Maybe foliotina. And in these photos, they kind of looked kind of red, but in person or like kind of orangey in person they were just really brown so I tried to get like a better more accurate lighting situation like that's kind of more like what they look like brown yeah it's a it, the color is probably a little hard to really assess because everything looks pretty wet too that's the that's the other thing um, so it looks like these were kind of wet when they were photographed and and it looks like there was probably rain either falling or had fallen uh, pretty soon before this uh, but these rings and the brown spores um, suggest foliotina 
or, or perhaps agrocybe or, or cyclocybe. Cyclocybe is an offshoot of agrocybe. Um, so I think foliotinum would have a spore print that was brown, but kind of cinnamon brown. And agrocybe would have a spore print that was brown, but kind of dark, like cigar brown, sort of. So if you remember any kind of subtle distinction. Mm -hmm. That, okay, that I sense. actually still have the spore prints in the kitchen, so I'll have to go back oh. and check. It looks on, on the on the ring on the one on the left. It looks kind of kind of cinnamony, but that that might be not not a real good indication. Um, I think these these might these might actually be cyclocybe arabia. Um, wow. The rings look a little like that, and those grow on lawns. This was these were on lawns. It was like um, on, on a trail in a, like these people, um, <laughs> they have trails in their woods. So it's all like, yeah, yeah it's kind of hard to describe. It's a trail, but it's their yard. <laughs> I, okay. My guess is Cyclocybe Arabia. Cyclocybe. These. Yeah. Oh. And if you can scope the spores, the spores are, uh, they're pretty big. And um, on the one end, they have like a, kind of a, a node sticking out of kind of like a nose or for lack of a better word. Um, so if you, you know what, if you have the spore print, if you can save some spores, um, if you can find somebody who will scope them for you, that, that might settle it. I mean, if you want to mail them to me, I'll scope I them. Um, I will do. Or, yeah, same, Marisol, same, Marisol's got a better microscope than I do too, so. Um, um, but I, I, my guess that's what these are. Cyclocybe arabia is a is a fall mushroom. Um, it does form usually form a well defined ring like these, like the, especially like the one on the right. Um, the 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 moisture on the cap is probably making the cap look a little different than it would otherwise. Um, on the other hand, foliotina. Uh, fol you know what foliotina usually has a stalk that's not as thick as these. And there's a few I different mean, folio. Mm -hmm. Yeah, folio teen is a little more slender and um, maybe fragile. The, the Psychocybe arabia. That's what I think these are. Okay, thanks. I just put that in my INAT so I can look into that better. All right. Okay. Um... The thing with Psychocybe arabia is that the cap is often wrinkled. That's what Michael Kuo says. Oh, yeah, okay. sometimes it isn't, sometimes it isn't. I find these on my lawn every year. I, I'm kind of used to looking at them. Uh, and when they're wet, it might look different as well. Yes. These were growing on the ground in Morris County, uh, hardwoods. Probably some kind of hygrosophy, but if the gills were a little bit more decurrent, I might say Cuphophilus virginius, they, but... They were decurrent. Here, I'll oh, zoom yeah. in. Wait, look oh, at they are. Oh, okay. Because the one on the lower right here, the big one, um, they don't look very... Oh, uh, I see. Yeah, yeah here, I'm going to say Cuphophilus virginius. Yeah, white sport thing, which is not a surprise with, you know, white, white, white here. <laughs> Um, um, would you mind repeating the genus? I'm just looking at it. Oh, uh, Cuphophilus. Somebody oh. wants. Oh, I can I spell okay. that one. If you, well, as long as I don't make a mistake. In, in <laughs> older field guides, it's going to be Hygrophorus. It's one of the waxy caps. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it There's... used to be Hygrophorus virginius. And then I think it actually changed to Hygrosabe virginius. And then I it know, went to Cuphophilus. Cuphophilus virginius. Yeah, there you go. Cap. yeah, that's probably uh, that's what I would guess these are. But there's a couple of okay. other white wax caps with the current gills. Uh, there's like one or two other species, but <clears throat> my understanding is a uh, couple of flowers virginius is probably the most common one. Okay. There, and there's one that's like really viscid too, that's really sticky. You can you try to pick it and it sticks to your finger. This this one doesn't look like that. No. I think that's Ar Arubinus or Ar Arubinus or something. 
anyway, that, that's what this, I think this is, Cup of Flowers, Virginia. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I think now it's time to move on. I think everyone that wanted to share from their screen got to do that. Do so. Is that correct? I got a few. Luke. Oh, go ahead, Lila. Okay. And was there anybody else that wanted to share from their screen before, after Lila's done, before I move on? Good joke. Okay. All right. So this is Lactarius indigo, found um, obviously in a pine forest with some other hardwoods mixed in birch and some cherry. You can see. We don't, the we don't have the image yet. Oh, it isn't sharing? Oh, crap. Second share, sorry. How about now, Dorothy? Good? Yep. Yes. OK, so like Terry Indigo. Can you do that? In the pine woods, mostly. And just by handling it, my, my fingernail, thumbnail cut in and just just barely grazed it. And you can see the, uh, the blue latex coming out. It, it was incredibly blue. I, I found some a week ago too, for really for the first time that I find ones that were in decent enough shape to collect. I found a couple of dried out ones over the years, but uh, we were on our way back from Vermont, actually, and I stopped at a roadside rest on I-87, and under some pines and oaks, there were a few of these, and really strikingly blue, and the blue latex, like you said, Lai, like it's all over your fingers and everything. Right. And I saved some, because I wanted to make green eggs and ham, <laughs> um, and but I fried the mushrooms too long, and I must have cooked out the latex. Um, because the eggs didn't turn green. So I'm going to have to find it again and, uh, in order to try this out. <laughs> if you add a little bit of lemon juice or citrus, it'll help keep that color to it when you're cooking. Oh, well, next time I'll do that. Oh, okay, thanks. Yeah. 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 Because, well, I cook the mush. I'm, I'm always afraid to not cook wild mushrooms long enough, you know, because you're often told, like, well cooked, well cooked, well cooked. But maybe not so much the case with lectarius. They're 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 not really fibrous. They're pretty easy to digest, probably. But yeah, lemon juice. Okay, I'll try that next time. Question about um, using these to dye things. Can they be dried and used to to make a blue dye in with the wool, Dorothy? Do you know? No, it's a it, it's not so, something that's gonna stay. No, oh, okay. At least two with the the things that turn blue in the in the bolete group. Um, but this is a latex. I don't know whether anybody's tried, but but I wouldn't think so. Okay. Right. Well, yeah, I would think that somebody probably tried. You know, given this strikingly blue latex that comes out of this thing. Yeah. You would think somebody tried and it would be well known if it, if it worked. Yeah. So yeah, my first time finding finding it. So that was that was exciting. Maybe in the book by the besets, the rainbow, the one about the rainbow. Mm. I, they talk about all the mushrooms that you can get the chemicals, the colors to dye. Mm -hmm. it, it may say there if um, I, I have that book, but um, I don't recall that oh, okay. that this is one of those species. Okay. okay. All right. Well, moving on. Um, keeping with the theme of everybody's got our malaria. Here's um, really a vibrant one. Most of the ones that I were seeing were very dull and um, and mature. 
And then I came across this old stump that had a bunch, bunch of stuff going on, uh, including, including these coming out. Which in the last two days, Lila? Um, yeah, this was on Sunday. Yeah, me too, on Sunday. These yellow ones, they just came out around here. I think it's Armillaria malia. That's what I think. But I yeah, think but Armillaria is to, to have, you know, I'm not real confident with species names on them. But is I that think a it's malia. complex? Is that a complex? Oh, God, Armillaria. Tom Volk has described like 17 North American species oh, or something gosh. like that. And there, I think there's like five we get around here in Northeast PA. Um, but the trait, I think the things you want to look for Malia, there's not a lot of ornamentation on the cap. And you can see a few of them are fairly bald, especially near the margin. Um, the, the partial veil is, is fairly persistent and a membrane. And it's not, it's not a cortina like on Gallica. I do, I do think I know how to identify Armillaria Gallica, which is a brown one. And um, and I found some of these also on Sunday. Same same exact thing, really. Okay. Uh, the, the, they're probably one of the better ones to eat because they're really substantial. You know, do you parboil them? Do people parboil them? Because I do. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I, I I have yet to to try them. They're a little bit slimy. No. So you, so you pour. No. <laughs> If you if you cook them long enough but not too long, they were that, that's what I was just getting around to saying. I agree. Yeah, you slow saute them. I, I cover the skillet for 10 minutes. So you shove them around a little bit so they don't stick and then uncover the skillet for another 10 or 15 minutes. And and you can cook the slime off them. And if you still think they're too slimy, use them in something like stroganoff or uh, some other kind of stew. Where, where that aspect would be hidden. Um, but they, they should be well cooked. There's a substance in armillaria that some people are allergic to. This, by the way, is probably the most uh, popular edible mushroom in where I live. They call it popinkies. It's a, uh, a, a Polish word that's been changed. I think the actual Polish word is what pinky or something like that. Okay. Um, we'll look at this one. We had some purple things going on as well. And I think this is like Caria um, purpurea. Very, very uh, bright purple gills. Okra purpurea. Right, okra purpurea. Yeah, you get a pale spore print from these, pretty much white, maybe a tiny, tiny bit of pigment in the spore print if it's really thick. Um, but that then tells you it's not quaternarius. And uh, anybody eat these ever? Yeah, I'll eat them once in a while. I actually yeah, eat the a few of these Yeah, the caps year. are not bad. The caps uh, are pretty good, I thought. I right. Think. I, I've eaten them, and um, I thought they were very tasty. But I like a firm texture, and they... They do cook up with that. Yeah, that's what I like about them. The caps, mm -hmm. um, you can put them in a stir fry or something like that, and it adds a lot of texture. Yeah, agreed. I don't even take the stems out of the woods. I just cut the caps right off. And mm -hmm. Yeah. I have no idea these were edible. Okay. Interesting. So good to know that, that one. Um, so people are typing in variations of the name Papinki into the chat, which I think is interesting. Various. Uh, Lots of names. Yeah, variations. But you can see the, the common pattern there, the Eastern European pattern. Because the root of the word means a stump. That's why. Uh, oh, okay. Stump. All right. So um, at a distance, I thought this was going to be blew it, but nope. <laughs> Get up close and, and look and uh, see the, uh, the cortina going on here in the young one. Um, yeah, the gills are a little bit dark too. But yep. boy, that cross section really looks like a blew it, the one in the upper part. There, that could be pretty tricky. Yeah. Parts and blew it's. 
Yeah, last week, um, Susan was talking about hard to differentiate nice. some of these things, but this one is definitely a Cortinarius, um, or the Cortina. There you can see those, the gills kind of brown and uh, the spores depositing down here. So that stood out. Um, but this was interesting. I cut the stem off and a wicked purple inside. I, I wasn't expecting that. That's pretty. Yeah. And there's the spore print, classic rusty brown, which you could already tell you were going to get that from the remnants on the Cortina. And that was that one. But I don't know which species. Does anybody have an idea on the species? We were <laughs> right. <laughs> I know. I, I, I laughed so. <laughs> yeah. Nice joke. Yep. <laughs> okay. Thing uh, to put the spore print on. It looks clear. Is that like a under plant? Uh, the what you would use under plants uh, under pots? I mean. Yeah, actually, it was the cover off of uh, some kind of a takeout container. You know, the the aluminum takeout containers. It was just like uh, I didn't have any slides available, so I was like, oh, this is sitting here. Let me just put it on that. So. And I didn't have to hunt for a piece of paper or something. So it worked out. Um, all right, last one. Suellus, I'm not sure the, the species here. I thought it was going to be granulatus. No, weaveray. Weaveray, weaveray, that's what it is. <sighs> you can, can forget about granulatus unless you're in Minnesota. OK, right, weaveray. Let me make a note. I must have 200 of these in the front yard. Yeah, that's probably weavery then. They're the ones that grow in like incredible numbers. I mean, I'm not disputing the idea that, that, that Igor provided. That certainly looks like it, but they grow in, in great numbers under yeah. pines. Yeah, there's white pine, uh, hickory, obviously. <coughs> and, um, cherry and it's kind of in the nexus of where all three of those are growing yeah these are obligatory uh, mycorrhizal with the white pine okay so granulatus is european and it grows with hard pines like two or three needle pines right oh that's a good photo there <laughs> yeah you can see the hymenium pretty well and the, the little grains that used to characterize you know the the old the, the old name granulatus um, but they're actually not grains or glands if you handle the mushroom and squeeze the stock a little bit your fingers will get sticky because those glands will break and there's kind of like a resin in them no i'll have to try that i didn't, I didn't notice that pardon yeah, it might be more apparent on, 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 on some of the other species of suillus, but but the ones that have little, little glands, they're, they're glands. They're not like they're not like scabers or or a, it's not punctate. It's they're, they're little glands. Hmm. Okay. Lila, are you in Huntington County? No, this is in Morris County. I would come and get them all. I marinate them. They're delicious. <laughs> oh, okay. It's too far for me to go to Morristown. <laughs> That's a popular way to, to make these. Do you, mm -hmm. do you peel them? Yes. Okay. Yes. I peel them and I parboil them and then I put them in the jars and with marinade. Delicious. I still have a couple jars from last year. Oh, wow. Look out how they're. Is that like a, a jelly almost like? Yeah. That's the, it's the a cuticle. The cuticle, yeah. <clears throat> I cut it in half and it was very sticky. So, yep. That's what and, people are. That's what people are peeling away. Yeah. And they smell uh, the most delicious smell of the mushrooms. I how do you 
described that I could, you know, I definitely had an odor, but I could not come up with a, a name for it. I don't know. To me, it's pine. Pine? It's like pine smell. Okay. That's the only mushroom I know and always cook. Hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, I should learn how to marinate them and try them that way sometime. I've never, I don't think I've ever even tried these anyway. <clears throat> Delicious. But they're a bit slimy when you cook them. Okay, I guess I've used up enough time, I think. Thank you. All right, cool. Weaver A. <coughs> okay, I'm going to go into the chats. I mean, I'm sorry, into the emails. Okay, and I will share them in the order that I received them. So Marisol is <laughs> first, and then Derek next. Okay. Okay. Uh, at the end of the foray, we go around the tables checking to see what we can, if there is something really interesting. So I found this uh, group of tiny mushrooms growing from wood and the base is white and um, I took it home and I did the micro. Uh, can you show please the, the gills and the micro? Yeah, very, very small. And uh, I think they have Kalosis tedia. You can see on the gills, Mm -hmm. um, that they look kind of serrated, but it's just the calocystidia. Mm -hmm. right. Those are the yeah, They have a name for that. I think they call it crenulate. Uh, I don't know. Crenulate when there's like that? The, mm -hmm. Yeah, when the, mar when the edges of the gills are covered with uh, calocystidia and they, okay. they look kind of uh, textured, let's say. Yep. Uh, but but like in a very sugar. tiny sort of textured way. Cr mm -hmm. Crenulate, I think, is the word. Okay. Yeah. So this is what it was giving that aspect to the edge of the gills. This type of calocystidia, a little bit capitate, as you can see, a few of them enlarge at the tip. And um, yeah, nice photos. And this one is from the stipe. So they were different than the ones from, from the Kalosistidia. So the ones from this type were, had like a bulbous base and a finger projecting from the middle. I think they call these Kalosistidia, is that correct? I don't know those yeah. names. I can't put those names in my head. I gotta, I gotta be yeah. there. Yeah. yeah. But for me, it's easier if I say from the edge, from the side, or from the stipe. It's, it's simple and easy for me. But I had to learn those names. I keep well, promising. It, it's, good, it's good to say that anyway, for everyone's sake, really. <laughs> yeah. And, and the one we just saw is close to the gills. You can see like a white. No, the one we see in the gills, the other one. When the stipe is getting closer to the gills, you can see this white cotton thing, that's the, the cystida we just saw, the, the microphoto. Look, near the base of the gills. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, right there. Mm -hmm. All right. So that's Samasvi centunculus. What a name. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> All right. 
So somebody found this and I got it from the table and it looked different to me. And I thought it may be this, this one. I thought it was something else, but then I look in the box and it looked like rugosa. And then I did the micro, my goodness, the spores are gigantic and almost like globose. You will see in the micro. Then I look on the micro and it matches. Look at the beautiful spores. And then I, the same photo, I had to make the spores blurry so we could see the clams which is another character of this um, clavulina rugosa. Is that the name? Yeah. 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 Clavulina rugosa. Mm -hmm. I love the spores. They're really neat. Oh, oh, another thing. The basidia is so long. 64.8 UM and very, very thin, as you can see there. And all these globes floating in there is it's like resinous matter coming from the, from the fungus. The big ones are the spores that are out of focus and the little ones are that matter when I squeeze it. Some mushrooms do that, some other ones are cleaner. All right, Clavelina rugosa. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not 100% sure about this one. I got to um, study this one a little bit more. I found this one on the table too. There was only one and it was everything pink. It was a little, it was getting in that shape, but I still managed to, to get stuff out of it. And the gills are a little lighter. Can you show the other photos, please? And you can see how tiny it is. Uh, the gills are the current. And uh, those, those are the spores with a prominent apiculus. And it has the most beautiful calos stevia. Looks like a grapefruit that you zoomed in on. Oh, <laughs> okay. Oh, yes, the, the tears like things. Yep. So that's from the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Helocystidia is from the edge of the gill. Mm -hmm. So that's this whole shape, right? Mm -hmm. Like almost like a bowling. Yeah, like a bowling pin. Like a bowling pin, yeah. Although they, there is one that is looking a little different, but in general, all of them were looking like that with a long neck. And I could not find any basidia to show you. So I got this photo from the center of my preparation. And so it's young, immature basidia. All right, cool. <laughs> All right, my last unicolor. So, Marcel, do you think that that purplish one could be a mycena? Maybe something like mycena pura? Or I know, pura. I know mycena. I know pura. This one is not pura. Yeah, okay. The 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 stem is way too long in relation to the size. Yeah, of the stem is really long for mycena yeah. pura. I agree. Did you t see if the spores were amyloid? Wait, no, I didn't do that. Oh, geez. You do that on mycenas too? Mycenas have amyloid spores, at least most of them. And things that used to be mycena and were moved out a lot of times Places. don't have amyloid spores. So. Oh, man. Uh, uh, yeah, well, most of the mycena, true mycenas have amyloid spores. Sometimes okay. it's weak, weak amyloidity, but usually oh. there's at least some change. Uh, for the future, I didn't know that, but thank you. All right, this was another, I don't know if I found this or somebody found it, I'm not sure. No, no, somebody found that. And I thought I I saw this before. Igor, do you remember when we found this one somewhere else on their oak? Are you there, Igor? Um, and, yes, yes, I am, yeah. And so I, I said, I, it looks familiar to me. And when I look at the scales, the scales are connected. 
it's like the scales make like a pyramid and then they are connected. I mean, you cannot see it on this photo, but you can see the gross aspect. No, of I it. see that. I can actually see it pretty well. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. okay. I, I don't think this is unicolor, which is granular. It doesn't have those pyramids. Something else, I think. Oh, and there is something. I this is a good thing. Yeah, I'm not one hundred percent percent sure it is because you can see in this photo that the edge of the gills is darker. When I look on the microscope, I was like, "What you'll see in the micro?" I didn't even know how to call that because it doesn't look like caulocystidia because there was caulocystidia and the brown things in there. Can you show the micro photos, please? Yeah, I think you call that marginate gills. Oh. Yeah. All right. You're going to see the micro. It was incredible. Yeah, I'll type that name in there. Oh, okay. A marginate? Marginate gills. Ma marginate. When, when, when the gill edges are a different color than the, oh, okay. the sides. Mm -hmm. Marginate gills. All right, those are the spores. And then, you know how, do you know how large those spores are? They don't look like Melasabi unicolor spores, oh, actually. Oh. Melasabi unicolor spores are more, um, more decidedly elliptic, not like, you know, oh. tapered on one end. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're big. Okay. Uh, I think, I would have to double check that, but I think I'm right about that. Okay. So this is what you see on the marginated aspect of the gill is that black stuff in there. So this is 100% view of that. And then this is a little, oh, they must be a little bigger. Oh boy, this is a little bigger. I have a bigger photo. I think the one before was 40, this is 100. And then I got the 400, you'll see the detail. It's almost like wrinkled grayish hifa that has no caulocystidia shape unless they call it caulocystidia with different shapes i have no idea can you show the next one to see the is this an example of what they sometimes call terminal cells oh okay i call it wrinkle I, I don't know actually I, i'm I don't know. trying to understand what that means yeah and and you can see that they are, have a wrinkled aspect and the color is almost like ash gray brown kind of yeah and they're really long and even they have septa so i just don't know so that's not the one i i was saying okay and now it has the this is from the side of the gills and it has the ornamentation the what is it that, is, is this name they Metulloid? Sometimes they call these things. Metulloid. Um, oh, metulloids, yeah. Uh, metulloids. Yeah, they have that ornamentation on the apex. Uh -huh. yeah. Um, yeah, nice. I'm, I think, once again, I think Melasabi um, Unicolor might not have these. Okay. I, I'd have to double check. I'll check. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the only thing that I didn't like was to, I mean, that for malocibe, those brown terminal cells, I have no idea what is what it is. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what those are either. That's Never pretty saw strange. anything like that. Wow. Mm -hmm. And I think I have a bigger detail of this. Ah, another view, another view of that from the side of the gills, and a bigger one now. Yeah, four hundred. All right. All right, so we're, so we're thinking not Melosophy Unicolor, no. right? Right. But some no. sort of and something the, in that. Uh, the gap is wrong too. Something in that Inosibe brown. Inosibe family? Okay. Right. Yeah, I'm not Sebastian. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't know what genus this would go in, really. Right. Uh, because it's but but having the metulloids is a clue. Yeah, that it belongs to that family. Okay. Yeah, well, that but it belongs to 
a certain genus in that family because I think there's one or two of those genera. There are four, which, I think. But but there's but there's one or two of them for which the mushrooms generally lack metulates. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And foliata granulosa. Right. This one was this I found it myself, and it's or uh, kind of ornamented on the cap, and small size granulose aspect and yellowish gills and the concolores with the stipe. And those are the spores, kind of yellowish. And this is the Kylosis tedia at 100%. Instead of having that, this one is, has another shape in the bigger part is towards the outside. Oh, I can't say that. You do see it, you see right there. The narrow part is the base, kind of capitate, if I can say that. You can see in the center, there's the, the base. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think they usually call this shape clave oh, because, okay. it, because it's oh, thicker okay. on top, but it's sort of tapered. Okay. Instead of having like an abrupt head, I get it. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. And this was also from the Carlos Estida. I don't exactly know how I got this. You can see the longer base and it's a tape. All right, that was it on the pictures. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I, I've ID'd this species a couple of times, and it, this looks like what I've called this by the same name, really. Yeah. Sometimes it has a little bit more um, appendiculate stuff along the cap margin, but that it doesn't have to. Mm -hmm. you know, but this looks like what I've called granulosa, and the spores look right, too. Oh, okay. Um, I only yeah. got that one because somebody posted one, and I said, I have seen this one, and then I checked yeah. one, and yeah. It's, it's a little easy to confuse with some of the small gymnopolis. And flamulaster, and the flamulaster ones. Yeah, oh, well, the flamulaster will almost always have the little triangular oh, okay, um, okay. Um, uh, deposits on the margin of the cap. Mm -hmm. and, and the flamulaster, I think it's a rhinocelis is what you're talking about, or a It's It's got the ornamentation is much more rugged okay. on, on the cap. But and those are easy to confuse, very easy to see. Sometimes foliotic granulosa has much more rugged, sort of coarse ornamentation on the cap. And you sometimes it has, edge. sometimes it has on, on the edge of the cap, it will margin, it will also have appendiculate material. And then they're really hard to tell apart. Oh. And, and, and in fact, the spores are even shaped almost the same way. So the that family. can be kind of tricky. Mm. Yeah, the, the flamulaster of mm -hmm. and the um, foliotic granulosa, the spores are not all that different. I, I'm not sure if the flamulaster spores are thin-walled or thick-walled. I know the foliota spores are thin-walled, and, um, and there's no ornamentation on the spores. What the spores you showed look like foli foliota spores for sure. Mm -hmm. All right. So, Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, and it's I'm interested in this one too because I've mixed it up with a couple of other things a few times. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay, Derek. Derek is up. Oh, Derek says he's not going to be here till eight fifteen. So, date sixteen. Are you here, Derek? <laughs> Okay, we'll come back to Derek. Virginia, your turn. Luke, that's great curation by you, timing that up perfectly. Yeah, did you see that? <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, this is from Horseshoe Bend Park in July on the 4A. Um, if you could zoom in a little on that one. 
these are very small. This is from a moist chamber culture. Um, and you can see they're only a couple of um, millimeters across. Um, they look like separate plates with the ridges between the plates. Um, and that's characteristic of these. Um, then go to the next picture. The cut, the reddish brown. And this, it was on um, bark. I think it was pine bark on the inside. They usually grow on decaying wood. That that was a little more close up, but you can see the ridges where the plates come together. And the next next. Okay, these are the, the spores and the peridium. Um, you'll see there's no capillitium, no threads, uh, which is characteristic of Lyceales. Um, so this is in the Lyceales group. Um, there's, in mass, they're kind of a dark reddish brown and um, in transmitted light, the spores are more light brown and um, they're finely spinulose along the uh, along the edge. Um, if you look at the edge of the um, peridium, it's it's kind of golden uh, yellow brown. Uh, and if you look along the edge, it has little bumps, little pegs, peg-like. That's another characteristic. So this is Lycia minima. It's quite common, but they're very, very small. <laughs> they're hard to find out in the woods. That's a better shot of the edge of the peridium. So that's that's about it. The, 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 it's fairly common, um, very tiny slime mold. <laughs> you can see the pegs along the edge. Um, on the, the right hand side of that peridium, the little the little bumps. All right, cool. Thank you, Virginia. Okay. So there's the name. If anybody wants to catch that again. Yeah, I can put it in the chat. Okay, so I'm sorry, I skipped over Dorothy. Dorothy? to go next. Are you there, Dorothy? Yep, waiting for the picture to get large. All right, so all, all of these were found today um, in areas that I own. Um, I own a, a little strip of land along the Passaic River um, and I also have a side yard where a, a creek kind of divides the property my house is on. But in the in the side yard uh, these were everywhere um, stretched out in in the weeds um, and you know, I, I recognize it as an armillaria, but um, I'm used to finding across the street along the river on my property years ago, uh, the ringless honey mushroom, uh, old name armillaria tubescens. But um, so, so these look certainly similar, but they were not, although they're clustered a little bit, cespitose, uh, they're not you know, on the base of a, an oak, they, they kind of just scattered over 30 feet, 40 feet in, in the weeds. And um, when you go to, I recommend going to mushroomexpert.com uh, and uh, Michael Quo has a lot of neat keys. So if you use the key to our malaria, it comes down to 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 Armillaria gallica, and it, it says in his description um, that um, it it's an innocuous sap saprobe, 
living on organic matter in the soil and not harming trees to any extent, according to Tom Volk and Birdsall, 1993. So it uh, grows on the wood of hardwoods, at least the buried roots, and occasionally on conifer wood, uh, and definitely um, east of the Rocky Mountains. So that's what I think this is. Um, it's uh, and uh, the next um, species I found across the river, across by the river, the Passaic River. Uh, this is um, has been growing for se um, um, over a month, and uh, I believe it to be. Hidnellum scrobiculatum. It's one of those dye mushrooms that if you heat it with um, a pH of nine, that you might be lucky to get some blues and greens on the dyed wool. Um, a close up of the underside shows very, very short teeth. I think it's the second picture I sent, this one, right. Uh, the next next picture, this is not in focus. This one, if we can zoom in a little more, you can you can see um, still not in focus, but it's uh, you can see the teeth of this uh, hidden alum. And let's see. Also, um, in the same area, and, and there's just massive quantities of this hidden alum. Next picture shows, um, and if you can zoom in, you can see this cobwebby veil. So I'm pretty sure this is some kind of Cortinarius, but have no idea. Uh, on, on the one on the, the left, you can see the cobwebby veil, uh, but it's definitely white, matte on top, no purple fibrils, um, spore print is gonna be rusty. You can see a little bit on the stipe of the run on the right, uh, but I don't know. I, I've looked in all the Quaternarius pictures of the Phillips mushroom book, but um, doesn't seem to match anything. And, and that's where I can leave it just as Quaternarius. Uh, the next picture, shows uh, the underside of very, very common Neophavilus alveolaris. Um, and I was reading also in uh, mushroomexpert.com, or no, it could have been the Wikipedia article. There are only four species in this genus Neophavilus. Two are found in Eastern Asia and the other uh, one aside from this one with a beautiful, if you zoom in on this and one portion, you can see these beautiful um, kind of hexagonal uh, diamond shaped uh, pores. Um, the other one that has been uh, transferred from Lentinus is Neophavilus suavissimus and it has gills under the cap, uh, with, but a very similar cap color, you know, that orangey color. And if these hang out for a long time and uh, lose that, that orangey color and they fade to white if you find them in the following spring. And finally, the last picture. Well, that's the top of the cap of the Neophavilus. The next picture shows, uh, if we can turn it, <laughs> um, four different rusulas that were in this spot across by the river. Uh, the one on top, which I'm looking at the picture uh, of mine, which is, it's on the left, but this is on the top. A lot of striations on the cap. This is one of the stinky rusulas. Um, it smelled 
we can zoom in on that top one. Yeah, I'm not sure if I can easily rotate it in this. Uh, okay, but the way I'm looking in, at it here, if I can zoom can, in. You can see the striations um, and it had almost that sweet almond smell, but it was starting to uh, uh, go more feeded. Um, I'm sure if it was wet, it would be viscid. And if we zoom, go down the image, there were three other uh, Rusulas, a red one, a kind of a, a grayish one and a, a pale peachy one. These three were uh, mild to taste, but you know I haven't done spore prints. I just got them uh, today from this, uh, this area right by my house. So, but that's that's all I have. If anybody has any other suggestions do think, on, do you think the gray one could be Modesta? I'm not sure, Dave. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, they, I, it's easier to tell Modesta when it's young and it has the bloom on the cap, the the pow, you know, the flowery center. Uh, right. Th this one. I think Modesta turns kind of gray on the margin and yellowish in the middle, I, I think. Yeah, this one got a little damaged on the top probably by yeah. a slug, so. Huh. Um, um, and by the way, Dorothy, I agree with your Armillaria gallica. Um, those guys tend to spread out in little clusters, twos and threes and fours on lawns and things like that. And the thing that really makes me think you're right is that you'll notice if you look at your Armillaria photos again, um, uh, the ring that's formed from the partial veil is really not much of a ring. It's more of just a collapsed little zone. And yes. if you can find some that are young, that are unopened, and you and and if you observe them, that the partial veil is is almost like a cortina. It's like stringy rather than a membrane. That would be another clue to right. uh, support Gallica. Um, but I find these guys to be really confusing also. And, and one more thing on the Neophavilus, there's a new species as well that's been documented in North America. And I think they're calling it Neophavilus americanus or something like that. I was gonna ask if we okay. could go back to Neophavilus as well, because I was talking to Luke, I think on Sunday, and he was filling me in a little bit about what's going on with the Neophavilus here in North America. I don't know if anyone wants to speak on that. Well, I can tell you, yeah, there is a Neophavilus americana, Mer americanus, that was described, I think just last year. That was from a single specimen in Connecticut. And then there's another um, undescribed species that's floating around there, out there that I know we've seen sequences from Pennsylvania and Indiana. So there's a couple of species out there, white ones. So they, you know, some of the white ones that, that are like old and faded undoubtedly are this avularis, you know, the orange one. But sometimes you find them and they're really white and fresh and you can actually get squirtopasis off of them. And then you can be pretty certain that that's another species. But I think there's a couple of cryptic species out there that we don't really understand yet. What, what uh, tree species are they? growing on. I tend to find them on um, beech and hickories. Uh, yeah, I would agree with that. Okay. Hardwoods. Little hardwood twigs. Okay. There, there, there is a hickory at this spot uh, where it was collected, but also oaks. So um, anyway, that that's that's these were all found today. <laughs> I love the diversity. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm lucky, lucky, particularly after the hurricane. Um, you know, there was just so much over there. Amanitas too. <laughs> and then when it's dry, it's there's nothing. <laughs> all right, cool. Thank you, Dorothy. So since we're talking so much about the honey mushrooms, I pulled this off of, um, it, was, it was on one of the Facebook groups that I'm on. Um, Gary Gilbert put this together. So if anybody knows Gary Gilbert, he's a Northeastern guy. 
um, and uh, comes to the nymphs and, uh, you know, pretty well known probably amongst some people here in this group, but he puts together some really cool uh, visuals for some of the Facebook groups that he's in. And this is one that he just posted the other day. So he doesn't have his name on it, but I'm giving him credit here. Gary Gilbert. Okay, he made this um, on different armillaria species of the Northeast. Um, so the first picture he has here, this is a, uh, an older Gary Linkoff picture. I think a lot of people probably have seen this picture before that this is a honey mushroom on the left. And this is a Gallerina on the uh, right, Gallerina marginata. So just pointing out the, how close that they can look to each other. And I think I remember when Gary Linkoff posted this, he said he found these on the same log within a few feet of each other. Is that ring ever going to look that red on an armillaria? Um, I don't know, to be honest with you. Um, it's ever going to look quite that red. This ring is really like effervescent. It really disappears easily, whereas you can see on the armillaria, it's much more distinct. Yeah, but, but you know what? Conversely, the, the other thing that I think is more scarier is that the young Gallerina can have a white partial veil before the spores start to fall. Aha, there you go, okay. Right, so, so, this, is, that, so this is only dark because of the spore color on it. That's gotcha. right, it's a white partial veil and the, when the spores start to <laughs> fall, it's like, a, like with the quaternarius, the, the, the spores uh, stick to the remnants of the partial veil. So on the young armillaria versus the gallerina, the, the gills at that point are going to be darker before they drop their uh, No, the gills on the young gallerina are also fairly, fairly pale. No. Okay. Yeah, there's cool. no ornamentation on the cap of gallerina. Why is that? Um, the, the, the partial veil is a, a little bit different maybe in, in ways that are hard to describe. Um, it's, it's, it's a little bit scary, you know, that, yeah. um, that these can grow on the same log. Yeah. You can you know, see when in doubt, throw it out. But if you want to learn, if you want to take stuff home and learn, take a spore print, you know, and then you're going to know. And this is one of the reasons why they tell people, not probably one of the reasons, that's the big reason why they tell people to go slow with honey mushrooms. So he, um, so I think there's four species. I don't want to go deep into this because I'm, I'm not really super qualified to talk on all these different species, but he points out in here, Armillaria malaya, this yellow one, has the brown or yellow caps that are often darker in the center with the white gills that are pretty attached. And I, I find them to be pretty decurrent, right? With that thick yellow uh, ring that we saw some of this, these earlier. And these are the ones that are often like really, really clustered together like that, super tight. Yeah, and, and Luke, I appreciate that stance. I think we should talk a little bit. If anyone has knowledge about honey mushrooms, I mean, we saw so many on Sunday. I've been seeing a lot the last couple of days outside of the Pine Barrens. So I'm sure a lot of people are finding these. Let's talk about yeah. them, if, you know. Yeah. Well, it's, this is the one people have information. Yeah, this is the one that uh, Dorothy was just showing, right? Gallica. Right. Brown or darker at the disc. Right. Isn't that what you said you had, Dorothy? Gallica. Right. Yes. Gills that are white, slightly decurrent, but uh, they're saying white, but these are look these look considerably darker than white to me, right? <laughs> Yeah, some of, at least one of the species of armillaria has gills that start to darken in age. Yeah, uh, the spores are white, but the gills get kind of dark. And if you boil them, there's there's at least one kind, um, <coughs> one species that when I boil them, the gills get pretty dark. You know, and, and you'll see something if you have more than one species in the batch that you're boiling, you'll see white gills and dark gills, and it's kind of a little bit disconcerting because uh, you think you might have, you know pick something that's wrong um, even on the even on the transfer home i find with these honey mushrooms those gills they change color so like what i observed in the field by the time it gets home 
it's a different color, you know? Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've never really paid that close attention, but that's, that's a good point. Something to look for. Yeah. And I can this see it looks a little funny here in the lower right. That ring looks pretty membranous actually for yeah. Gallica, but, yeah. but, um, you these know, are I, tricky. They're tricky. I mean, Malia is usually really yellow, and it's got the scant um, ornamentation that's usually only in the middle of the cap, and it's and the and the ring is pretty persistent and membranous. So Melia, I'm I feel pretty confident with. Usually Gallica, and then you get into these ones: Solidipes, so over here, um, uh, Jemina. Yeah, there's um, a Jemina. Yeah, there's, there's oh, oyster. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> really, I, I honestly, I don't know how to tell them. So they're syn he's synonymizing solidipes and oyster. Yay. Okay. Um, okay. And he's saying that's primarily Western and Central U.S. Again, this is one guy who's pretty well respected, but I, I'm not, I can't. Yeah, it's a, it's, vouch a, for that. it's a nice thing to to try to put out there. Yeah. And then, um, and of course, by the way, is it is Desar Malaria? You know, I think it, somebody may have told me recently that Desar Malaria is now going to be deprecated and they're going to put them back into our malaria. These uh, ringworks, uh, maybe I don't know. I've, I've heard, I don't think so. Heard for a couple of years, people really okay, back and forth okay, okay. So here's Armillaria tibescans, which is the old name. So now we're calling it Des Armillaria sepitosis. So these are the ringless ones, right? So no ring on it, um, tapers at the base and usually growing in these clustered, uh, you know, these groups. So the big takeaways here are these guys are ringless and growing in these clusters, usually on buried wood, right? These have the rings, usually growing these clustered clusters on wood or very close to wood. And these guys, Gallica, these are the ones you're usually finding on the ground, like singly or like in little troops. Those are the three that I personally feel like I see most often. If I've ever seen this other one up here, this solida piece. I've been you want to see it? Come I've over. Been I've been unclear. I have the, tons of them in the woods. <laughs> How do you know the difference between solida piece and uh, Gallica? Gallica is lighter. It it feels like I found it in the grass, and it's kind of very light color. But Solidipus is dark, and kind of nice and fat little mushrooms. I was in the woods yesterday, and uh, there's a lot of them. Does the veil on uh, uh, Solidipus almost look like a cortina? Is it kind of web-like, or is yeah. it yeah, yeah. It is. Yeah. Yeah, I think I've shied away from them because of that. Yeah, yeah. but it says here that it's membranous. Yeah, it says membranous, and it says here for Gallica. Gallica is the one that has the cobweb veil. Oh, maybe I had that backwards. No, I think it's not solid on that solid piece. Too bad I did not take pictures of, of the veil. Well, I'll go there tomorrow. <laughs> hey, yeah, you should take some pictures of it for us. So, okay. So, yeah, so. I always like a tutorial on these like seasonal mushrooms that we have going on. So, well, there you go. There is that. Uh, or malaria, or armillaria tibescens, whatever it's been called. I found that mostly in September. I haven't seen any of that in quite some time. Yeah. Maybe late, late August, early September this year. Yeah, that's typical. I think that the dust Desar armillaria shows up earlier, like late summer. You might still see it now, but it definitely is like that one that comes up late in the summer. Yeah. Whereas the other ones, you know, the Malaya and the uh, Gallica we're seeing now like super abundantly. Yeah, that's in, interesting. In the in the southeast, they get Desar malaria before the summer sometimes, like June, early June. Wow. Yeah, it's 
I think Desire Malaria is a little harder to pin down to, to the, ti the timing. Um, they seem to come out at when they want to. It, maybe, maybe, the, maybe it's just a certain fluctuation in temperatures, soil temperature or something, you know, that brings them out. But um, I found them early and I found them late uh, in Northeast PA. They're not very common here. I don't find them every year. Last year, I was collecting them in September. This year, by September, they were all dead. It was too late, probably mid-July. Wow. Okay, have we had enough of honey mushrooms yet? <laughs> okay, I have four observations. Only one of them is actually mine, and then the other three are from our uh, our foray this weekend that I just took pictures off. So, you know, honey mushrooms are having a uh, banner year, but so are these Anonotus hispidus. These things are, they are all over the place. Usually, usually I see them every year. Um, they're these big, heavy-duty, uh, sh shaggy bracket. That's what they call them, an iNaturalist. And that's a pretty good name for them. You know, these things are about six or eight inches across. They're squishy, right? So they're not real firm. Um, when you squeeze them, they're often exuding liquids. These were wet. These were being rained on. They have that really hairy uh, top to them. Hence that name, Hispidus, meaning hairy. Did did anyone save them? These weren't worth saving. These were so saturated in water. I didn't. I didn't think they were worth saving because they were. What do you mean? Look, look because at all, they're a wonderful dye mushroom. You know, there's a ton of them out there right now. Um, Dorothy, I, yeah. they're still on the tree. Come over even tomorrow. I don't know where you are. <laughs> I will. I will let you know. I will send my address to Luke. I'm sh I'm serious. They are still on the tree. But yeah. look, is it the color? Is it the color of the fresh mushroom? Um, this is yeah. This is the accurate color um, of a fresh of a fresh mushroom. Yeah, this is a fresh mushroom. It's wet, okay. but now it's it's more orange when it's young. Like the tops are very orange. Yeah, they can be really bright orange. But what orange, this one? Orange, orange to brown. They have a kind of a yellowish, brownish yellow spore, uh, pore surface, which bruises. This one doesn't show any bruising on there, but if you touch does it, it, it bruise. And does it have like pearls underneath? It that's, seems that we see some drops, right? That's, that's just liquid. It does exist. I think it, it has a gutation going on. So that's that's gutation there. That's all just water. This is literally water running off of it. <laughs> there's, I think there's spider webs on it too that are And spider wet. webs, yeah. Yeah. It was a wet weekend. <laughs> yeah. What are these called, Luke? Ina notice hispidus. They're yeah. super soft, like velvety on top, mm -hmm. squishy like a sponge. Yeah. When they get old, they turn blackish. Hmm. Yeah. If anybody wants to go down to the Pine Barrens right now, just look around. You'll find tons of them. They're all over the place right now. Yeah. yeah. All, the South, all the South Jersey, they're everywhere right now. Oh, yeah. well, Susan Hopkins was wanting to go to the Brendan Byrne foray, but she didn't make it down from, from upstate New York. But this was one of the mushrooms that she wanted to collect because it's such a good uh, dye mushroom. So I, think she went, I think she went home with one, at least. So oak. I don't, I don't think she was there. No, no. So anyway, this is on oak. That's what we. How would you preserve it, Dorothy? You dry it's them. It's so wet. You slice them up and dry them. Yeah, um, you dry them. Dehydrator, cut them apart, dry them. Okay, so there's that one. And then these three, these next three, these are these were some more of the interesting ones. The one that I found personally interesting at uh, the foray of Smithville. So I called this um, Craterellus uh, scenarius, scenarius, scenarius there at the 
for radio the other day, I wanted to change it to Venosis because I was doing a little bit of investigation on it. They, they look pretty similar to me. They're both, they have that kind of grayish uh, underside to them with that really heavy detonation veins. But one of the differences that I read in the Bissette's book is that Cenarius does not have a smell, whereas these things were really distinctly floral. I smelled a whole bunch of them. So Venosus smells? Venosus smells, yeah. Ah, because the one that I find in Smithfield for so many years, it smells like rancid butter, but it's an agreeable smell and they are delicious. An agreeable smell? Yes, because these were agreeable. I, I I thought they smelled like floral to me. Like yeah, that floral, like a typical chanterelle kind of rosy smell. Oh. Bill Yule is the one who suggested venosis on these. I know he looked at them a good bit. But I thought these were interesting because this, this is not one of the trumpets that I personally typically say. Usually I find that corner corpoides one. Is that brown color on the top? Yeah, that's the top. Oh, wow. So that's what they look like from above. But when you flip them over, they had this grayish black color. Would you still eat that? It looks a little dry. Yeah, probably. I always feel like black trumpets always look kind of ratty. <laughs> fair, fair. But yeah, these, these look pretty decent. They, were, they weren't like great, but yeah. If it wasn't South Jersey, I would have eaten it. You see all the sand all over them. It's not like they have gills that you need to clean through. You just wipe them off with a, you know, wet uh, rag. I don't know. I hate grit my food. I found these really nice chicken of the woods down in the Pine Barrens, and I grilled a whole bunch of them up, and they were still kind of gritty, even though they were like four feet off the ground. <laughs> I love the Pine Barrens, but the, uh, it's just, they're always kind of gritty. Oh man, I was uploading in a hurry and I did a blurry one. There we go, there's a better one. So these were uh, uh, Havela Crispa that were found at Smith Fell. And these were beautiful. They were a good solid three to four inches tall. Never seen that. It's a fascinating sight. Yeah. And the interior looks just like this. In fact, you, know, you cut it, you can barely even tell you're looking in the interior. It's just all chambers like this throughout. So what you we're looking tell, You can tell on that one on the right how it kind of just funnels right down into the stipe. Yeah. At the top. Yep. At the top. Yep. So we're looking here. That's the cap. And the hymenium, I presume, is the top, right? The interior. That's where the spores are being released from. And then that's the stipe, the actual stalk that's lifting it off the ground. So these are fairly closely related to morels. They're in the ASCO family, and I think pretty closely related to them in the ASCOs. Isn't this type called lacunos? Lacunos? Hmm. I don't know the def. I've heard that word, but I don't know the definition of it. Okay. Yeah, yes, that's what I heard them called. Lacunos. Those kind of holes. Yeah, chambered. Yeah. So I thought that was one of the more interesting ones from the foray. And then the final one I put in here only because I've never seen this species, or if I did see it, it was only once before. Teroporus rosio albus, rosia albus. And I can't really speak much on them, except that I, to me, it seemed, it was something I don't normally see. So, but typical Teroporus with the hollow stem, but much thicker than the, you know, we're used to seeing the ones that we always call castaneous, which I guess are now Smithii and Borealis. You know, there's been some name changes, and some uh, better understanding of the species that we have in the area. But those tend to have the really thin stipes. I don't know. Is there anything else anybody can say about these? Anybody that's more familiar with them? 
I went to Igor when I found one of those on the table and I said, this is the, the Castaneos group. And then he said to me, no, it's the Roseo, whatever name you said. Rosio Albus. Roseo Albus? Rosio Albus, yes. Okay, cool. Because it looked kind of like the Castaneos. Do they belong to the same family? Did you say that? Yep, the same genus oh, okay. as the Castaneous group. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. Cool. So you're right, it does. It's got the same kind of like reddish coloration to them on the stipes. And the stipes are also hollow, just like the Castaneous group. Mm -hmm. But they're thicker and more robust. And these are a little bit bigger than what I normally would see for that other group. These were, I don't know, three inches across. This is a little more robust, a little bit bigger. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. Was that color on the stipe um, present when you picked them, or did they kind of stain that color? Or? Yep, that's the color I think they would be. Okay, cool. That's the color they would be. And I didn't personally pick these. I don't know who picked them. Somebody put them on the table, and I don't know if they had a name on them. I was just kind of, I was just kind of going through the tables, photographing some of the lesser common-looking stuff. So. So that's that. Those are my observations from this past weekend down in southern New Jersey. And Dave, actually, did Derek? Did you make it in, Derek? Yes, I did. Oh, sorry, I'm late. Okay. So let's look at yours, and then we'll um, jump into Dave's. Okay. Okay, so this one I am sort of confident about. Um, I know that we were discussing last week how these can look really similar to um, Portinarius. Um, so I found these just yesterday. And if you go to the last two pictures, um, I just uploaded the spore print. So that's on a black background, the color that it looks, and then the next picture is on a white background. I think that's the only one there. Oh, well, I must have not uploaded. But um, it looks kind of tannish on a on a white background. I mean, it looks kind of tannish on a black background too. Um, so even with the spore print, it's pretty hard for me to tell exactly what it is. <laughs> Um, if anybody has any. Probably a Lepista, maybe Lepista Nuda. Could also be Lepista Arena. They're pretty similar. Hard to tell apart. Yeah. The pink, the pink spore print really is like, you know, a pale, pale, pinky brown. So that's what you were thinking it was, but that's, that's what we usually call pink. Yeah. Yeah, okay. you can see that pink in there. So, is the top bluish? Is the top of the mushroom bluish? It's more of like a swede brownish with like a lavender on the under. The blue it is the blue it is bluish, right? They can be. But yeah. The, yeah, they, they fade they, when they get old. Right, yeah. they're pale. They cool. So this is a it's a blue it. <laughs> There you go, Derek. Good job. Are you going to eat it now? Um, Are you still still maybe tomorrow. <laughs> maybe tomorrow. We we just had cream of bluet soup for dinner. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Don't they say that's a really good way to do bluets because they're kind of soft and soft. Yeah. Yeah. So like, yeah, I um, I take the young ones that are firm and slice them and fry them and put them aside. And the older ones, I fry up with, um, um, I saute with uh, onion, celery, and a little bit of garlic and put it all in the food processor with some chicken stock or vegetable stock and mm -hmm. process it. And then I add uh, bechamel sauce, white sauce also. And, and then I put the pieces in that were separately sauteed. I also put quartered Brussels sprouts in too. That goes well in the soup. Um, <laughs> That's awesome. All right, yeah, Derek. the blue yeah, are really, really strong flavored. So they, the flavor can be spread out really well. 
You can mm. also dice them up and make like a duck cell and put in mashed potatoes. That's pretty good too. Are there any toxic <laughs> lookalikes? Are there any it. toxic lookalikes? Yeah, Cortinarius. All right, Derek. Let's let you, let's let you get into your last one, okay? Calvatia rugosa. I think that's one. We yeah. So this one. Often. Yeah, I thought this was interesting. Um, it's it, it was quite big, maybe four inches, and clearly a puffball shape, as you can kind of see better in the other picture. But what was super interesting about it was the staining. Um, so it stains a bright orange when you slice it or when it just naturally fissures open and then gets oxidized that way, I guess. Um, but yeah, super interesting, I thought. Yeah, you know what's really interesting is I've never seen this in my life. <laughs> and the, just this year, I found it once and then I've seen like on Facebook, just like at least two or three other observations of it right here in Philadelphia where I'm at and now you mm -hmm. have one. It's like all of a sudden, just out of nowhere. I've never seen that before. <laughs> yeah, you know, I looked it up with Mushroom Expert. He's got a whole page on it. And it seems like it's more common in the Midwest. That was the impression that I got, but uh, yeah, this was probably this must be the fourth observation of it I've seen this year. Is it always crack like this? No, I think that's just because this is a really overgrown specimen, big and kind of blown out. What Doing... name did you see? Look, I'm sorry, go ahead. What Rachel? name did you hear any name? Oh, Rugosa, Calvatia Rugosa. Oh, wow. That's so, so cool. The, what I saw, the, like the one that I found in the other picture that I've seen, which was about a month ago, they were smaller and more orange, but they were definitely in the same vein as this. Do they grow just on meadows, like other calvatia? Uh, this was on mulch. Yeah, you found yours on mulch, okay. <laughs> Mushroom expert says gardens, gardens, like horticultural areas. Cool find, Eric. Thanks. All right, thanks for sharing, man. Okay, Dave. All right, I'm, I'm catching up. I was on vacation for a week, missed a couple of weeks, and I've got a lot of things I still need to put on Mushroom Observer, but I don't think I've shown this one yet. May, I may have before I left. Um, I think this first one, oh no, this was from, this was from the Adirondacks. Um, Karen and I met uh, Susan Hopkins. She took us to a spot, um, Rock Creek, a Rock Pond Trail near uh, Blue Mountain. And there was like unbelievable diversity that day. Saw lots and lots of mushrooms. So this is Porphyrellus, um, used to be Tilopolis. Um, and I believe this is Porphyrellus. I think it's a Porphyry sporus or something like that. Uh, I haven't written, what's well, it's here. It's a mushroom observer. So the name is, is, is provided. Uh, so it's like this dark sort of bully. It's got sort of a dark, uh, poor surface. Um, and I should have cut these and, and taken a picture of, of staining. Um, I didn't think of it at the time because we were just finding so many mushrooms. So, but I got a couple of pictures of that. And um, you can move on to the next one, really. I, I think the next one so, is something that well, there, I. Um, there's the. There's the there's the name if anybody didn't catch that. No, that was a uh, okay, Porphy Rice Forest. Okay, yeah. Porphyrellus. Yeah, it used to be Tilopolis. Some of the older yeah. field guides are going to call it Tilopolis. And ah, uh, Igor, are you still here? Yes, I am. Oh, uh, so this is really interesting here. Um, this cluster of ball eats, I couldn't get any spores out of them. Um, the flesh stained really dark. 
um, not real quickly, but the longer you wait it, the more it stained. You can see the dark staining on the stalks. Um, I thought maybe this was some sort of telopolis. Uh, the pore surface seemed to be a little bit brownish. Somebody else, it looks like, um, uh, proposed anthoconium. Um, I suppose that's that's a sensible proposition. I, I don't, don't think it's anthoconium. You think it's anthoconium? I don't think so, no. No, okay. All right. What do you think it is? I mean, this is really weird. I, I saved some. I tried some out. I had my dehydrator with me. And I saved it looks like uh, Tilopolis, the uh, poor uh, surface staining uh, pinkish brown. Yeah, that's what I thought, Tilopolis. Um, I didn't propose anything, but that was my best guess, Tilopolis. I just put it up as Boletessia and see what people thought. This is an indoor photo later at night in the cabin we were staying in. And um, after I... Um, I guess I cut the caps off. Decapitated. I decapitated them, right. Yeah, there you go. And, um, uh, but I did save. I've got a bag full of this dried out. So pretty interesting. I, you know, really, just maybe just an anomaly, you know, in growing like this. <laughs> it's like one great big stalk with all these caps coming from it. Pretty strange. A mutated Tilopolis from space. Yeah, yeah. So, so Dave, you're on, on Facebook. There's a mushroom group called Dumbass Mushrooms Who Don't Know How They're Supposed to Grow. Uh, and this will be a perfect candidate for that group. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, maybe I'll look that up. It's actually I'm a pretty, so behind it's, in my posts, really. It's, a, it's, it's actually a pretty good group because it's always just, you know, bizarre, like, growth forms like this. Yeah, Dumbass Mushrooms. Yeah, that's one. <laughs> <laughs> don't know who how they're supposed to grow <laughs> that's really strange this thing yeah that is yeah that was in mixed woods beech birch maple some conifers spruce hemlock maybe some pine here and there yeah, it's hard to tell balsam fir it's hard to tell what that was associated with really there's a real mixed bag out in those woods Okay, so when we had our uh, NJMA foray at Kittle Field uh, in Stokes, we found some um, tricholoma fulvum, we ended up thinking they were, that had yellow gills. It was a real head scratcher. And then I found on Champignon du Quebec um, that they have proposed a sort of, I don't know if they're saying it's a variety or what, of tricholoma fulvum that has yellow gills. And then I seemed to find, well, I didn't find it. It was collected at a um, Wyoming Valley Mushroom Club for you at Moon Lake Park in Oak Woods. Um, looks like the same thing. Looks like a tricholoma fulvum with yellow gills. So just an interesting thing. I, I saved some of this. I dehydrated some of these. And um, I, I looked at spores. Tricholoma spores are almost invariably pretty boring really they all sort of look the same but um uh interesting mushroom i didn't look at anything else besides uh under the microscope besides the spores so that was an interesting one i thought interesting that we would find them in the two different places a few weeks apart that, that look so similar can so i ask the spores don't tell you, give you a lot of information. Pretty much tricholoma spores pretty much look like that most of the time. But an interesting find, I thought. So for people that are not familiar with tricholoma, I'll just point out very quickly that one of the things that has always helped me understand tricholoma or identify them, is first of all, they come out late in the season generally. But see this notch in the gills? See where the gills attach to the stem? See that notch in there? Tricholomas almost invariably have that notch in them. Yeah, and white spores, they're all white spored and terrestrial. Okay. So generally, you don't start seeing tricholomas until about now. 
in our area, in our area, like southern New Jersey at least. And probably Same not here. probably not much, yeah, sooner up north. Same here. The one exception might be Trichelomus saponaceum. Sometimes you'll see that early. Um, but I have I don't see that very often around here. But yet, generally speaking, the trichelomas start up in September and they and they persist late into the season. Mm -hmm. So we and saw some of them don't even come out till November. Yeah, it seems like you in the Pine Barrens, I mean, you, you have to go down there after it gets darn cold before you even see them. Right. So we saw a lot of tricholoma or dorm this weekend at Smithville, like quite a bunch of it. Yeah, I've been seeing that one too. It's been it's been out on my property uh, for quite a while, actually. That one actually started up kind of early, early September. I started seeing a few of them here on my property. Uh, seem, seems to be associated maybe with hickory, the ones I was finding. We even okay, found so, the uh, Stokes for a in, in, uh, in August growing with hemlock. Yeah, 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 yeah. They seem to they seem to start up kind of early, the, at least this year. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think I showed this yet. Uh, no, I don't think I did because this I found these right before I went on vacation, and uh, these were collected at um, Wyoming Valley Mushroom Club for a. We found two groups of them. And this is sometimes called the gypsy. I'm not sure why they call it the gypsy. Uh, they do tend to grow in groups. Um, and in the past, I found this Cortinarius caperatus, which in older field guides, it's going to be Rosides caperatus or caperata, Rosides caperata, because uh, it used to be put into its own genus, but now it's been put into Cortinarius. It's the only Cortinarius that I, that I think is worth eating. And in fact, some cortinarius are poisonous and you really should not experiment with them. But if, you're, if you are um, confident about identifying this species, they're pretty good edible. Unlike other cortinarius mushrooms, most other cortinarius mushrooms, maybe with the exception of maybe torvus and, and um, um, oh, the one with the widely spaced gills, um, distens, um, you don't, often see a well-defined ring on Cortinarius. You'll just see a collapsed Cortina that makes a zone. But these guys have like a membranous partial veil that forms a, a persistent ring. And when these expand, these are a little bit young, but when these expand and get bigger, the ring is pretty close to the middle of the stock, which they will call a median ring, meaning it's near the middle of the stock. Um, and um, so I ate these, uh, my wife and I ate them and they, they were good. Uh, I found another one today actually, also in Moon Lake. The funny thing to me was I usually find these where there's hemlock in the past. I don't find a lot of them ever, but I've usually found them where there's hemlock. And this year, two nice good sized patches were in an area where it was pretty much only oak. And it was pretty clear they were growing associated with oak which uh, was a surprise to me I've, I've heard that too dave i've heard that um from nursery people people that like um grow hardwoods they find them in their tree fields oh okay i, I always thought they were associated with conifers because yeah. we find them in the pine barrens so much yeah but, i find them by hemlock once in a while and i've never found them by oak before and, until this year the one I found today, a nice big one, uh, was in an area where there were there were there were oaks and and pines. So I'm not sure, you know, what that was associated with. They also have. If you look at this, is a good picture to see this on. They have this bloom on them. Yeah, it looks like they're dusted with flower, especially when they're young, and when they get a little older, they develop radial wrinkles on the cap also. Not not striations, not true striations, but wrinkles that are radially aligned, so emanating from center outward. These what are a little. These would are you say small. that is? Oh boy, um, it's hard to tell light, from the picture. Light brown. I mean, that is the color that they were. Yeah, like a deep champ, like a deep champagne color. 
Deep champagne. Okay, that's they're almost good. kind of pinky. Are there? Are there? Is there a little pink in there? Uh, you might you might say that. Yeah. The the cop the picture is pretty accurate though. This yeah. is okay. pretty much the color they were. All right. Yeah, kind of like a subdued golden color. But yeah, you're right. There's reddish. In subdued there. golden. Yeah, that's. <laughs> but the 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 flowery bloom is a pretty good clue. You might be looking at these. They get kind of white with age, correct? Like, yeah, the bloom really doesn't seem to go away. They get old, and you'll still see it. Yeah, and um, so that's I think that's what you mean by they get kind of white because they 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 main they retain that bloom on the cap. You can see the one right here we're looking at. Um, the center of the cap is pretty white. And that's what we're talking about. Yeah, I can only reference these from one of the forays that we had. Uh, it was the Brendan Byrne. But the one that we found was super white. Like, I mean, pale. Didn't have any rose. Yeah, that would be a little bit unusual in, in my experience. But the Pine Barrens to me is like another planet. Everything's different there. <laughs> you can see on this one, because they, they do, I mean, it's clear they have this really thick uh, uh, annulus, but you can see on here, doesn't it look like they still have a little bit of a Cortina to them? See right in there? See, um, that's what yeah, throws me like There might be a little bit of stringiness mixed in there. Yeah, which would be which would line right up with their quaternarius. Yeah. Connection. Although for many years they were they were not considered to be a quaternarius mm -hmm. for qu quite a number of years. Only until about I think 10 or 15 years ago, probably DNA put them in quaternarius. Right, because I mean we would, most people wouldn't call this a quaternarius. Just just by yeah. casual just by casually looking at it. Right, it's an anomaly in terms of being a quaternarius. What was the old name? Does anyone remember? Rosides, R O Z I T E S. All right. And it was, Last. I think it was Caperata, not Caperatus, or it might be the other way around. I only learned that mushroom two weeks ago, but I thought it was a Strafaria for the entire time that I've seen it. Yeah, 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 that that would yeah. be a reasonable um, um, confusion until you get a spore print. Yeah, I can see that too. Yeah, the spore stropharia have really dark, grayish, purplish brown spore prints, and um, and this guy has a spore print that's not all that different from the typical quaternarius. It's uh, brown with a little bit of a rusty tinge. Oh wow. All right, so I know Igor is going to tell us here that this cannot be Philoporus rhodoxanthus because that's a European species. But in terms of the available nomenclature in that you find in um, field guides and so forth, that's what they're going to call this. It's got the yellow basal mycelium, um, not white basal mycelium. But you'll see here on Mushroom Observer, I just proposed that name as a could be, just because it does apply in a certain sense. Um, but this is probably some un, unnamed species, some undocumented species. I'm not sure if I saved this one. Uh, it was right before we went on vacation and there were some things I just didn't really have time to get into a dryer. I may have saved, I don't know, I've got, so many bags of mushrooms from this year, it's ridiculous I, that I have to like go through and catalog. Um, so many mushrooms this year, really, it's quite a year. Silvaporus so, rosanthus is an American species, but we have more than one. And the question oh, is, okay. All the right. question so, is, what is the real Rhodoxanthus? Because we what is the real Rhodoxanthus? Oh, okay, yeah, okay. Well, then I misunderstood, thank yeah. you. Well, that's one. That's candidate, you know, and it's it's. I've got it. I pre. I may have dried that one out. I'm, what what's the date on that? Twenty fifth. That was a couple of days before we left, so I may have got that one into the dryer. There you go. 
These things are pretty good to eat if you can find them before the hypomyces get on them. Yeah, and before they spread out too much too. Yeah, yeah. when they're like small, like little buttons. Yeah, this one would have been good to eat actually. They're pretty common in my area. So in the middle of the summer when I'm like camping, that's when I eat more mushrooms than ever is when I'm camping. So I don't have anything else to do. I'll, I'll, I'll collect a lot of these sometimes because they're pretty common. In, the, in a good year. And just for those of you who aren't sure what this would be commonly called, it's called a gill bully, which is an oxymoron, more or less. And so on that point, phylloporous is every gill bully is going to fall into phylloporous or? No. Yeah. Uh, oh, no. No, go ahead. No. Go ahead, Igor. Um, one species that used to be called Thelaporus boletinoides is not a Thelaporus. I forget what genus it was transferred to, but it's not a Thelaporus anymore. Oh, really? Wow, that's interesting. I didn't know that. Thanks. Yeah, I think it's uh, Thelaporopsis. That's this. That's the genus. Thelaporopsis. Oh, well, yes, Thelaporopsis boletinoides. <laughs> yes, and that one you find in the pine barrens. It doesn't grow anywhere else. Oh, interesting. All right. Yeah, there was a paper a couple of years ago. I have it, of course. It's old news now. And if I'm being honest, how do you tell that that's a false, you know, that's a that's a polypore? Like, how do you tell that's a false gill? Because it looks like a real gill to me. They are gills, but uh, if you look closely you would see that there's intervening and uh, all these seven septa that connect these things and they're kind of modified pores. And, you know, it's possible that some bullets just develop gills um, spontaneously. You know, it's a plesiomorphic feature. You know, other fungi have gills. They're not necessarily gilled. The mushrooms in the true sense. Um, you know, polypores have gills too, right? Oh, uh, sure. betulina, right? So uh, they look like gills. Yeah, I guess it depends but, on how how specific you want to define a gill. But I mean, exactly. If a, if a gill is just like a radial hymenial surface, right? That's connecting the site to the edge of the mushroom. Yeah, sure. blades. A blade. Yeah, you have blades. You know, you have chanterelles. They don't have gills. They have pseudo gills, wrinkles. <sighs> Same kind of idea. So we, we're, we're dealing with a feature that probably evolved more than once and at different point in times and independently. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Cool. Which is the definition of plesiomorphic trait, if you look that word up. Does that have to do with uh, phylloporous, plesiomorphic, phylloporous? No. Mm, no, but plesiomorphic is just a totally unrelated word. Um, Cool. But Thank it you. defines any morphological trait that brings things together that are not necessarily related to each other. So they did not uh, evolve from the same ancestor. But these features can just spontaneously evolve from something else. There's a, another term, convergent evolution. That right. if, if where where if, seemingly unrelated, even genera, develop the same final outcome right, right. They've, they've they've right they've come up with the same solution independently like how gotcha. how do they create more surface area to spread their spores out and this is going to be confused with concerted evolution which is a totally different thing oh, awesome uh, thank you dave Good observation. Oh, you're welcome. And that brings us to our conclusion of our regularly scheduled observations. I haven't read any uh, any chats in a while. I think people are saying good night because it's getting late. So anyway, I'm going to do the same. I want to thank everyone for coming and sharing and for a very good taxonomy Tuesday session. And I will leave my computer running if anybody wants to hang out and chit chat in the uh, after party. But I'm going to say good night and I will see everyone next week. Bye, Bye Luke. Thanks, Luke. Good night. Good night.
Good night, Luke. My bluet has not decided, or if it's a bluet, decided not to give me any spores. So maybe it's too young. May need more time. That Come reminds on. me. That reminds me, Bianca. I'm going down to the garage to check a couple spore prints. Good luck. <laughs> Does anybody mind if I show my lactarius? Go for it. Please do. I, post, I posted these online in multiple groups. Nobody chimed in. <laughs> so hopefully you guys can help. I think they're lactarious, but I'm not sure what species. <sighs> mm. They already look cool. They remind me of Chelidonium, but um the chelidonium i've seen have been whiter like paler um and more blue well they can discolor did you find these on the conifers under white pine okay i think it's either chelidonium or chelidonioides yeah I, I agree it's one one or the other i'd say did you get did you find any latex on your finger or anything it's hard to get latex out of these but sometimes you can get a little on your finger if you uh, slice a gill slice the gills and press a little bit i did slice to see what would happen and um the gills stained but i don't think i got uh, i don't think i got anything really obvious on my finger but they did like you'll see underneath that um You'll, you can see the staining on some of them. Can you zoom in? Sure. And actually, let's see here. Pretty sure that's what these are because they always appear on their conifers in the fall. You don't find them in the summertime. What is the difference between the Chelidonium and the other one that you said? Um, I don't know. I have to look it up. But uh, those are the roughly two species. There's also... Uh, another species or two, one is called the subpurpureus, that's more purple, and there's also paradoxus. And when they get old and discolored, they all kind of look the same. But the one that, the greenish, oh you know, go ahead. A paradoxus is more blue, I think, uh, on top. And um, subpurpurea has wider spaced gills. And, and you can usually find some of the wine red latex exactly well you never see the green discolorations like this so i'm pretty sure this is chelidonium or chelidonioides yeah actually suprapurious uh, a lot sometimes it will it will stain green in areas but the original milk is uh, uh kind of scanty and then oh, purple, yeah like, like beet, beet juice yeah beet juice or wine red wine right yeah yeah and then, well, there, there are, by the way, there are two varieties of Chelidonium. Ah. Yeah. So, but you might need to look at four to be able to tell those two apart. Um, so, so they probably look pretty much the same, you know, macro wise. Okay. Now I know Chelidonium, well, I've heard is edible. So I'm curious. A, have any of you tried them? How are they? And um, B, is that other species you mentioned, is that also edible? Um, no, I haven't tried these. The only lactarius that I eat are the trio of uh, Lactifus, Carugus, Valimus, and Hagrophoroides. I haven't eaten any other lactarius. Okay. You know, I haven't eaten these, but I'm sort of tempted to try them out. They're probably not that really, really that good, but I would. You know, I'm sort of tempted just to be able to see. Um, That's how so I feel too, because I find them every year. Um, although this is a different spot from where I normally find them, and I just haven't been brave enough yet. <laughs> I would nibble a little bit first just to see if they're acrid or bitter or anything like that, you know, before you actually cook them up and try to eat some. 
Yeah. So, so you guys I, were I, saying on the milk on these, they start out as red? No, I think the milk on these is like this dirty yellow sort of, but it's hard to find. Mm. The, the, it's the subpurpureous that has the red latex. And these are oh, not okay. subpurpureous. Yeah, these are not subpurpureous. What really confuses me here that we see both green and purple discolorations in the gills. And I just posted the link uh, from Michael Kuo's uh, page of uh, uh, Chelidonium variety Chelidonioides, and it doesn't mention purple anywhere or green in that description. Yeah, that's kind of interesting, that purple. Yeah, I see it. Mm -hmm. huh. So I have to find uh, other descriptions for that species. So, uh, so this subpurpureous, subpurpureous. Yeah, these are these are not subpurpureous. So I know no, the 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 gills not purple enough. Yeah. Yeah. It's also paradoxus. Yep, and that one's usually kind of blue on the top. It looks a little bit like indigo from the top. Yes, but it, it can fade. Remember, these can fade a lot. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, you're right. Um, so I'm looking at Paradoxus, uh, Michael Kuh description. Uh, milk, very scant, dark purplish red, staining surfaces, purplish red. But we're seeing here green as well. I wonder if there could be two species here. I mean, from the top, they all look pretty much the same. Did you find these under white pine? Yes. Okay, then I think it's Chelidonium. And they were all in the same um, pretty smallish area. Like, it's not like I was in what giant park and I found them on the opposite side, you know? Yeah, the Chelidonium I found in the past are much whiter. Just discovered probably when they're really nice and fresh, they are green or bluish green. But you see some of the small ones where they were they were small, and I mean I assumed that they were young because you can see they're they're small and they look really tiny and young. Yeah, I know, I know what you mean. Well, uh, I have you know we have to go and check the uh, the beset book on the milk, milk caps, uh, but I think we're digging in the right. Uh, fishing in the right pond, so to speak. You know, we know okay. they're close to that family or group or operational taxonomic units, you know, that kind of thing. So yeah, I've got, I've got the book here. I'll, I'm going to look. Because I, I see this green and purple at the same time, and it really confuses me. Yeah, the also, left front one looks both purple and green, doesn't it? Yeah, and also the cap color is this kind of um, uh, grayish, you know, fuscous, kind of a uh, purplish violet that's not really strikingly or brownish. I don't know. I mean, I think they're discolored. Maybe they were rained on. Um, kind of a mottled uh, appearance, you know. It's When I first saw these, I just didn't know what they were. And they were not outwardly chilidonium or paradoxus or superpureus. So what did you see, Dave? Of uh, the photos in Bisset of Chelidonium, um, either variety Chelidonium or variety Chelidonioides, that look pretty much like these. The Chelidonium may be a little bluer on the cap, but as you said, they can fade. Uh, it looks like it looks like what they've got as Chelidonium. In the book. Now, let me read the description and see if we can find anything about purple staining on the gills, because that's that's a pretty interesting thing. Orange. Oh, there was also another really interesting feature about these. I think, right? Oh, this was, was this the one? No. No. What was the one that had the orange mycelium? Oh, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. You know when you find too many mushrooms and then you get mixed up oh. on which ones oh, have look. which characteristics. Um, oh, no, never mind. I'm looking at the wrong thing. Oh. I want to take a look at the descriptions and see what the descriptions say. Yeah. 
uh, latex chiridonium variety chiridonium latex yellow scanned changing to dingy brownish yellow to dingy yellowish brown staining gills green okay so at least we're getting somewhere green is the color we can see here as well and tridenioides variety tridenioides rather uh what does it say here about that uh the cap is azure blue in the upper half of the cap and paler dingy yellow near the gills not much really difference so i would provisionally call these just chiridonium okay um i'm not 100 percent sure if this was this mushroom or not i'm tired and i <laughs> i'm mixing up my mushrooms but i feel like um these had bright orange mycelium at the bottom of the stipe and then by the time i got them home and photographed them that bright orange disappeared that was a really interesting feature yeah the description here in the sets book it doesn't say anything about the mycelium unfortunately um in sandy soil under pines july september edible okay what's the soil type is it sandy there no no it was grassy yeah but i've seen them here on my property too under white pine which now are gone because uh, the evil board of trustees cut them down <laughs> they were they were growing in the soil that's not sandy either so okay. i have them in the bag too so if you have any questions let me know they're probably all dried out by now That's all I have though. That's it. <laughs> I can find more. You want more? <laughs> no, we're here. <laughs> uh, I'll have to upload them. If anybody else has stuff to show, go for it. Lila has something I can feel it in my bones. <laughs> She's always so holding something back, you know. I got, I <laughs> Waiting got, for the right moment. I got I got two things. One, one, I'll show you my first um my cross the uh, photos I'm willing to share. So let's start with that. It's on a dull thing, but that we can't identify, but we'll try. All right, so the Satharella. I know there's hundreds of them, but there's like thousands of them in my garden right now. And they're coming up everywhere. Are those the same thing or just uh yeah they're the same thing they start out these little in the foreground these yellow yellow caps oh, and then they color right kind of, yeah tawny uh then they get this whitish brown then almost white and then they turn basically black what well, do you I'm think they've fairly um, young you get a sport print from them I did, and I even have a photo of the spores. So. Oh, and, and you know what? The um, deposits on the cap, that, that's like a satharella type thing. Yeah, yeah so anyway, the spores. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah. Uh, satharella. I mean, the only other thing I, I can think of would be paniolas, but these don't look like paniolas. Some the caps are hygrophonous, which is typical, I think, for both uh, genera. Yeah. Yeah, and those those don't look like paniolus spores either. They look like satharella spores. What kind of spores do uh, paniolus have? Uh, like lemon shaped. They're really big. Um, yeah, they, they have more. They're, they're not as boring as these. You know, these are just these sort of boring ellipses, you know, but pan paniolus are a little, the spores have a little more character. You know, they're shaped a little a little bit more provocatively yeah. and they're really dark too they're you know under the scope they're really dark yeah so some kind of satharella yeah see if you can get a print on a black surface and see if you can see any any contrast 
between the print and the black surface. All right. Can I just move my slide over something black and see what it looks that, like? That that works to a certain extent, but it, when you have these really subtle contrasts, like really, really pale uh, instead of white, or really, really dark instead of pure black, yeah. um, getting the print right on the surface is is usually easiest to see the contrast. All right, I'll look for something black and take take another. Yeah, score. you know, if you can't find anything else. Get a a, gloss, a piece of uh, paper out of a magazine that's that's got glossy black, and and the reason why I say glossy is that mag glossy magazine paper tends to not absorb moisture readily, so you put stuff you put take a spore print on, um, um, regular paper and it draws moisture out of the mushroom, and then that that changes what what the spore print looks like. Okay. Like could at least there, but there, there's some kind of separate. Oh, wait. You know what? I, um, I was gonna say. Okay, you know what? There, I think there's a couple of species of parasola that look like this. But you know what? Parasola do not have deposits on the cap. So I think that might rule that up. But parasola have black spore prints. Um, but the one you showed from. When you show the picture from top down, it looked like there were deposits on the cap. Yeah, and this, these up here at the top and the back have some kind of deposits on them too. These I, I suppose the only other thing you might consider would be um, coprinellas. Um, and those would have pure black prints. But it's, I would say it's not exactly black it's it's a super super dark brown yeah that that's that's satharella then yeah to, i would yeah. i think so i'll i'll see if i can get some more prints tomorrow on on the shiny black all right so that was that one here's another one i don't know what this is feel like it, it should be identifiable, but I haven't really worked on it. So, albatrellus? Albatrellus. Yes. Yep. There's a blue albatrellus. It usually grows under conifers. I forget the species name. No, let me check. Uh, albatrellus of Alvinus? Yeah. Alvinus like is white. White, like yeah, beige, that's, that's, sort that's of. True. There's a blue. There's one that's sometimes it's all blue and sometimes it's only blue underneath. And I think that's probably what this is. It's in the Beset book. I just have to try find the name. Yeah, I don't have the books right here with me. Uh, but there's that's there's so a cool, blue huh? um, uh, albatross. Yeah, I think I found the name. It's called the uh, Ceruleoporus. Yeah, I think that's it. And boy, yeah. that would describe this. Can you put that so, in the chat, please? Yeah, I'm going to type in the name or copy and paste, I should say. Thanks, Igor. All right, so that's okay. super brown on the top, and those pore surfaces are blue. Yeah. 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 Sometimes uh, it's bluish on top, too. Um, but I think probably more commonly it looks like this. The pores and the white. look huge. Yeah, yeah, they, they almost look like teeth after a while, right? Yeah, that one's probably been there for a while. Did you find these under hemlock? Yes. Okay. Yep, that's a hemlock species. That's it. I think we got it right then. In New York or New Jersey? This was in New York. Okay. Yeah, I don't have any hemlocks around locally here to go. Almost. It almost looks like the pore surface is running like a decurrent pore on the stipe. Like yeah, it's... the whole, whole stipe is. It's, it's... Oh. Yeah, it looks reticulate, which was real, which as actually a, a continuation of the of the pore surface running down the stipe. Correct. It just gets stretched pretty... out and. Uh... Yep. Yep. Pretty interesting, though. Well, they are not bolites, but they certainly appear to be bolita you know what wannabes 
In so some, are they po uh, polypores then, or? Uh, let me see what they are. They actually, and yeah, they're in the polypor polyporalis. Yeah, so and they, I think they're mycorrhizal uh, also. What's but that? Yeah, I'm always stunned when you, oh, it's some boring, you know, brown amorphous looking mushroom and then you turn it over and, and you're just shocked by what you find. Actually, according to uh, uh, Michael Kuo, they are associated, actually, they're related to the russulus. They are in the russulalis. Oh, jeez. Oh, exactly. So you see my really? point about, you know, things evolving uh, from different ancestors many times over and over and over again. You know, they're not bolites, yet they have pores. And yeah. they're fleshy. They're not polypore -pore like, you know, but this sort of kind of in between. <laughs> you can't yeah. call it a russula, though. But you can, but you know, look at the uh, other example of Rusovas, uh, your, uh, um, what is it? The Bondarzeve Berkeley is a Rusova. Oh, wow. Wait, really? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, in that, and it's in the same group of uh, uh, polypores. You know, it's in the Rus Rusovales, you know, it's in there. Oh, wow. That's awesome. Because it has uh, the same reticulate uh, uh, spores as Rusovas. And genetics confirm that. I gotta see what you're talking about. What's the name of this thing? Wait, which thing? The one you're talking about. Yeah. That one. Oh, uh, Bondarzeve Berkeley. I'm gonna type it in. Thank uh, you. Bondar. It's it's a Russian name. Bondarzev. Bondarzeve uh, Berkeley. All right, Lauren, you're up again, or somebody else. All right. I think it's something like this. Uh, Which is commonly confused for the Bondarzewia, at least, is commonly confused for uh, the hen of the woods. Sometimes it looks like a bleached out chicken of the woods, late the forest and griffola. Yeah, so uh, uh, Ku says that uh, the order Russovales contains, uh, you know, uh, things like Albatrellus, uh, Bondarzevia, Heterobasidian, uh, Russovas, you know, uh, uh, and, and maybe even Zalabolos. So it's a very diverse uh, order, you know, having different kind of mushrooms that don't really look related to each other morphologically, but genetically they are in a sense, in a big group. Hmm. Very fascinating. Yeah. I'm going to give you the link for that too, so you can take a look at it, see what's in it. Now, this is a tricholoma. Okay, that was my guess. Yeah, and, I think uh, it's subluteum. A subluteum. Um, or or Davisier. Uh, or, or fumosa luteum. Well, I don't know. I don't think I know that one. Or well, uh, I know the Fimosa luteum very well. But Where does that grow? It grows with pines, with the pine barrens. Oh, plant! I, I should have guessed. <laughs> and so we don't think this is Subsejunctum, right? Subsejunctum is darker. Darker. Okay. But it could be. You know what? I don't think you can rule that out. But it's usually darker. Look at the look, look at the gills that turning yellow. Actually, I'm going to pull out my uh, tricholoma. Yeah, subsejunctum has gills that develop, a, especially along the margin, a little bit of yellow. It's usually darker though. The the three of them, and 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 the other one you mentioned, Igor, but um, subluteum divisia, I think it's called, and subsejunctum can can be difficult to tell apart i don't think this is divisia i'm familiar with divisia i can actually id it from pictures alone it has a yeah. very unique look divisia has the the sharp umbo i believe so maybe we can roll that out here more importantly it has tiny fibrils on the edges of the cap as 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 the as oh, the okay all right 
So sublutium, substitutum, and uh, fumosa lutium. You know what? I might have the. Oh, I have the trichoma book here. So do I. I seem to have it right here. Fum what was that? Fumosa lutium? I don't know that one. Yeah, that Yeah, fumosa lutium, I think, has more of a. Uh, uh, it's a uh, fumoso lutium means smoky yellow. Uh huh. So it has yeah. a very glabrous, very naked cap, almost like um, waxy, you know, to touch. Yeah, the picture in the in the trichoma book is is quite brown, actually. But it's not oh, wow. it's not the best picture in the world, to be honest. It's kind of dark. For fumosa lutium. Yeah, fumosa lutium in the in the. Um, in the, the trichoma book, it looks very brown. And the gills don't appear to have any yellow on them. But let me read the um, description. I have an observation of Fimosa lutium on, on, a, on a mouse, so I can probably post it here so you can take a look uh -huh. at, the, uh, at the mushroom. Yeah, the description, the gills don't mention any yellow for fumosa lutium. Um, it's not fumosa lutium. It's uh, it, the, the, the one that is shown here. Uh, is it uh, Bianca's or is it uh, Lawrence? I forget. This is mine. I think it's sublutium. It's either sublutium or it's, you know, from the substance. No, substitutum and subjunctum, you know, it's a species complex. And uh, I think subjunctum is European. Yeah. But we do have European trichomas here in the Eastern North America. We uh -huh. do have, so you have to be careful. All right, I just added that to. Um, so you think it might be trichoma subludium? My best guess, yeah. All right, I just added that to INAT. Okay. So, I have here. Fumos the lutium, so I'm going to post it uh, the link. I'm pretty sure that's what these are. And I do have a specimen, so maybe they will get sequenced. Maybe they did get sequenced already. I have to check. And the gills in those also turn, I think, uh, yellowish. Wait, is this uh, uh, the same specimen that Lauren just presented? What is this? What, what this? It's some sort of a Nasabasia. Yes, I oh. think so. Too. Okay. Yeah, like a fiber like a cat. black spore print. You got a oh, it's not if you got a black oh, spore print like Cremaria, Maria, of Cremaria like Remunda, yes, yeah, yeah, or one of the Lacry Maria. There's like three species, but um, wow, that's a tricky one. Ho oh, ho, you got us. <laughs> All right, let me uh show you the underside. Yeah, let's see the underside. It was kind of hard to photograph because it was so close. That's yeah, a young one, but. 